<laughs> so, so, rather than me uh, just launching into something, what are you curious about? I was wondering how you guys like plotting orbits once you launch the rocket. What goes on with that? I heard something about the launch points at one point, too. <laughs> I got a couple of war stories about that. Uh, how do you plot orbits? There is actually a software tool that, uh, well, back up. There is a new nationwide competition sponsored by the Air Force that high schoolers can participate in. And I just formed a team at SMA. They just had their first competition. They discovered that they weren't prepared. <laughs> <laughs> but they are using a software tool that was provided by the Air Force Association. It was written by AGI, Advanced Graphics. And that is literally the tool that both NASA and the Air Force use uh, when they're doing orbital design. Okay. So there's a tool you use. To well, it. that tool is not available for public consumption. Uh, it is highly restricted. Uh, it's not classified, but it's borderline. Okay. For example, you can download the software and install it, but uh, you can't use it until you get a license from them. And that license requires that they have information that specifically identifies your computer. Okay. <laughs> And that software will only ever work on that computer. Uh, you, and if you try copying it, sorry, it won't work. Okay, so they were using it. But to answer your question, there's a total of about 12 parameters that are involved. Now, try out your geometry. The orbit is actually a uh, spherical plane, okay? And it intersects the Earth. Now the spherical plane doesn't change, but the Earth rotates under it, okay? So, point of reference becomes really important. And what coordinate system you use becomes really important. That's why when you look at, say, the, the big board and mission control or on television, what have, the, or, the orbit they show you is the ground track. That's the track over the Earth's surface, and it looks like that. Okay? Well, it's sitting there going down around the Earth, and the Earth is turning under it. So that is a two-dimensional pro projection of a three-dimensional object. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> and it is that uh, transform between those two kinds of coordinate systems that result in the dozen parameters that we use to define an orbit. Because an orbit may be, well, let me give you some examples. Uh, a geosynchronous orbit. What does that mean? Spot. It's hovering over, like relative to the ground, it's hovering over one spot. So, right. when geo means our surface, synchronous means right. Okay, so where what is its orbital plane got to be if it's going to stay over one spot? There's only one orbital plane that'll do that. Come on, math geniuses. Geometry, hello, well, solid geometry. It would have to be a circle, right? Well, all orbits are spherical at least. Yeah, right. It would have to be going <laughs> as fast as the Earth is spinning. It would have to be an equatorial orbit. Oh. Is it an equator? It would have to be over the equator. Over the equator. Otherwise, its ground track would do that. Oh. Oh, because of the way that the Earth spins, right? It's got to be over the equator, or it won't be as straight of a line, right? 
but where but then it doesn't where you draw it. So the equator is always at the part of the spinning point. Though. You have to set it. Yeah. Okay. So would it have to stay over the equator, or would it just stay yeah. right there? It stays over the same spot on yeah. the surface of the Earth. Which means that's another thing. Uh, its altitude is somewhere between 22,000 and 25,000 miles from the surface of the Earth. Okay? Because that's the altitude at which the rotational velocity at the surface and in orbit is the same. I'd like to know how they figured that out. Simultaneous equation. Rotational velocity of the Earth's surface, rotational velocity at the orbit, that's called omega. You want omega one equal to omega two. Okay. Yeah, that's only a, that does work though. That's two simultaneous equations. What do you do? My fifth graders do that. Okay. You, so you teach at Sarasota, you teach at Sarasota. Yes, I'm right. Okay. I teach primarily physics and computer science. You and I drive the math teachers nuts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, do you have Colin Boyes this year? Shut who? Colin Boyes. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other thing that I use there are two topics that I have to teach in my physics courses because they are never taught at the high school level. Okay, one of them is vectors. Vector addition, vector subtraction. I do not teach vector multiplication because they don't need it yet. However, if I taught AP physics, they'd need it. Because in AP physics, we have vector cross products that happen primarily in electricity and magnetism, and even in orbital, because there is this thing called rotational inertia. Rotational, say, angular momentum, rotational inertia. That's in physics, okay? Well, those are both vector equations also. Have any of you ever messed with a gyroscope? Yeah. Okay. There is a video, I wish I could find it, <clears throat> real quick, it's on YouTube, that shows a guy with a metal rod about that long is what it looks like. And it's got a steel disc on the end of it, okay? And he uses a drill to get that disc spinning really fast, okay? Well, he's setting up a gyroscope, okay? And... Before he starts it spinning, he has a weightlifter take the other end of it that from, the, from the big wheel, metal wheel, take the other end of it and try to pick it up. Okay, can't do it. Okay, it's leverage. Okay, but after he spins it, this guy reaches over. Uh, da -da 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 -da. No problem at all. However, he's got to keep turning in the same direction gyroscopic precision, but that's a vector cross product. And what's happening is the angular momentum is counteracting gravity, so you don't have to hold up what's out there. Oh. It goes this way. And the reason it goes that way is because the Earth is spinning that way. This is not anything like the, uh, the weight created by a prop on an airplane. Uh, similar. Where it pushes the weight down. It's a similar thing, but you got a lot of fluid dynamics going on there too that complicate life. So, <clears throat> you are all math people, right? Do I have any faculty present? You should not be under a here, but. You should get a flat tire. Oh, yeah. Well, I have a proposition for you that you folks are going to get to deal with. It will happen during your tenure going forward and whatever you're going to be doing, okay? And it's going to come from a combination of computer science and physics. 
in the physics world, quantum physics is making new discoveries all the time. It's still primarily a black art, but basic thing, well, that's another subject. Chase a rabbit. Anytime there is an equation with a fraction in it and it has a denominator that can become zero, ding, 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 warning, warning. Right. Okay? That means we don't understand it very well. Okay? For example, law of gravitation, black holes. Radius goes to zero. Gravitational force goes to infinity. Math is fine with that. Physics says, and eh, can't happen. Okay? Another example, difference between mathematics and physics. Take a geometric progression, geometric series. So you're taking half of something all the time. Well, according to math, you can do that. That knows you. Wrong. <laughs> In physics, there comes a point where you can no longer take half of it. Disagree. <laughs> because, <laughs> because everything in the universe is finite. There is no infinite. Universe infinite? No, it's finite. It isn't. But I disagree. <laughs> However, there are major parts of it we'll never be able to observe. Why not? Because in its original creation, there was a phase called uh, inflation, where the, uh, and this is theory, but we have some evidence to lead us in that direction, <clears throat> that the universe expanded faster than the speed of light. Right. Therefore, that part of the universe that expanded faster than the speed of light, will we ever be able to see it? No. What if the speed of light Because the light never down? reaches us. What if the speed of that isn't the speed of light also shrinking as well? Nope. Still a constant, isn't it? <laughs> and it's still a limit. Huh. So we'll never be able to observe all the universe. However, everything we're seeing, otherwise, especially from quantum, <clears throat> is saying that everything is in fact finite. For example, have any of you ever heard of string theory? Yes. Okay. A string is supposed to be the quanta of energy. In other words, the smallest, the quanta of energy. And to try to illustrate the size of it, <clears throat> if we took a hydrogen atom and made it the size of the universe, a string would be about the size of a tree. In the universe. It's about the size of a tree. Oh, okay. The about the size of a tree. Oh. So like universe, tree, and a hydrogen atom, hydrogen. string. <laughs> So it's really small. Really small. <laughs> well, there's another illustration. I use this one. Carbon atom. Okay. If my fist represented the nucleus of a carbon atom, first of all, it'd be mostly nothing. Okay. How many electrons would there be? Anybody remember your I, I nuclear or chemistry or six, right? It's six. Right, six electrons buzzing around it somewhere. What would their orbital volume be? What would their orbital radius be of those six electrons around this nucleus? Like a football field. Yeah, like. No, it'd be 17 miles away. Yeah, um, ridiculous. If, you're, if, the, if his fists were yeah, the size of the nucleus. Of the nucleus. So within that 17 mile volume in three dimensions spherically, there would be six electrons. And each electron is about one ten thousandth the mass of one proton. So they're kind of small. 
So, and what else is in that volume? in between the electrons and the nucleus. Yeah. What else is there? Supposedly nothing. Mostly nothing. So everything is mostly nothing. <laughs> I like that. I'm use that. Well, it's got a lot of something. No, even something's mostly nothing. Yeah. No, it's because everything you touch, you're not directly touching the nucleus, you're touching... The Actually, we never nucleus. touch anything. Right. Yeah, really exactly. <laughs> Actually, what we experience is the mutual repulsion right. of two electromagnetic fields. <laughs> Everybody touched the table. <laughs> <laughs> or didn't touch the table. <laughs> you're feeling the difference. Hey, in my physics classes, I prove that everything is, in fact, an illusion. Mm -hmm. And at the core of physics, what we're attempting to do is to reconcile the difference between what we observe and what is. And that's where math comes in. Because what is the essential role of math? What is the essential, fundamental character or nature of math? What is it? No. Isn't it a way of understanding everything? We're headed in the right direction. A way of communicating functions. What is it? What is the what is the primary thing or role that math does for us? I'll give you a hint, a quote from Carl Sagan. Anybody know who he was? He's dead yes. now. He's a guy that gets quoted a lot. <laughs> <laughs> He was, he was a theoretical Cosmo. physicist. He was the first one to produce the TV series called Cosmos. And the burden of skepticism. Right. Well, his quote that I like is that physics is a skeptical way to interrogate the universe. So what do we use to interrogate with? What do we use that is skeptical? Man. And why are we able to do that? It's because math is the native language of the universe. Notice I said language. It is a language. It's a way of communicating. Right. It's how you communicate ideas. It's how you explain relationships. What do we use to explain relationships between us? Language, vocabulary. Okay. What's an equation? relationships. Now, I have discovered that attempting to help people learn math from that perspective works a lot better really? than memorizing equations. I'm surprised that works better. Oh, it does. It's not a true. You just well, the difference is yeah, it's, the mean, difference is instead of trying to memorize stuff, yeah, try to understand it. You're understanding. Instead of memorizing things and processes, you're understanding what ideas. So, when you have some kind of math that you're dealing with, try to relate it to something somewhere else. Because math, computer science, physics, I don't care what you take. Any of those is worthless by itself. All of them require something else. So math is important in the context of what do you use it to do? It's a tool. Okay? I see why that works better. And if you've got a toolbox that's full of tools, but you don't have a clue of what the tools are or how to use them, how useful are you? They're not. And if you're going to be using those tools, what have you got to do to become really good at it? Practice. That's called a skill. Now, when I was in college, I wound up, by the time I graduated, I had taken 11 physics courses 
and 11 math courses. I couldn't decide what I wanted to major in. I wound up majoring in physics because I had labs with physics, so I wound up with more hours in physics. Okay? The other thing was the school I was going to did not, they, they, the only math major they offered was theoretical mathematics. And very early on in my college career, I crossed paths with set theory and topology. And I said, check me out of here. I am not interested in that. Okay. So all of my math was applied math. Now, does that make it easier? Absolutely not. However, since I was working at the same time, by the time I took the math, I had already been using that math professionally in the work. So in most of my math courses, we would have come to a new topic and I'd say, oh, that's what that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so that was my advantage. It was about the only advantage I had. Because I was working full time, married with a family, and going to school. It took me seven years to finish. Were you a doctor? No, <laughs> bachelor's. And when I graduated, I didn't even go to graduation. I said, color me gone. Yeah. I'm out of here. Were you going part time then? Because no. you were working full time? No. I was doing full time everything. Okay. You just had a lot of hours that. Well, the school I was going to, uh, they did, we did a semester's work on a quarter calendar. So we did 16 weeks work in 12 weeks. It's like always being on the summer, like and, the uh, summer course. And semester. in order to qualify for full time, I had to be enrolled in 12 semester hours. And that was 12 semester hours in 12 weeks instead of 16 weeks. So it's really more like 16. more like sixteen hours. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm taking six semester now. When I was younger, I did twenty, but I can't do that. And, I, and, I, and my work, my work was not forty hours a week. It was closer to six because we were in the middle of the Apollo program, yeah. and I was involved. My role was guidance and control. So you asked the question earlier about figuring out our guidance and control. We had to figure out how to get from launch into orbit, then do whatever we needed to do in orbit, and do wherever go wherever else we needed to go. With a computer that had a four kilohertz processor clock speed <laughs> and four K of RAM. That was uh, it. Now, it was still there was nothing else. How big was that computer? About the size of a car battery. Yeah. For that time, yeah. And we wrote in machine language, and we had to time how long the instructions took because when the data was presented on our input side, it didn't get stored anywhere. We had to be waiting for it to take it off as soon as it appeared. So as soon as it appeared, we had to take it off, do our calculation, send our output, next. Okay. So we didn't have operating systems. We couldn't afford that overhead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I saw this documentary before, though, about the you know, space station right now. It's like they haven't changed any of the computers since like '72. Wow. I know. Well, with Shell, uh, Shell was based on '70s technologies. Okay. Yeah. With the first shuttle, the astronauts carried laptops with them to supplement. Right. Okay. So if you had to process the data as soon as it came in. We had to be waiting for it waiting to arrive. To arrive because you couldn't miss it because it wasn't getting stored. 
do you would you say that some data was lost because you guys couldn't possibly be there? Well, no, we got there. We got it all. Okay. We got there. <laughs> <laughs> we made sure we got there. Yeah, kind of important. Okay. And there was one mission in particular, uh, the one I got this pen for. It was actually two missions. It was called the Pegasus mission. And at that point in time, this was still this was way before the Apollo. This was still when we were having short duration uh, orbital flights with Gemini and Mercury. And this way, way, way early. But we had done enough to realize that there was this stuff up there called micrometeorites. And what that is, is something that's really small, but it's going really fast. Okay. So something the size of a grain of rice going 50,000 miles an hour relative velocity, if it impacted spacecraft, make a really big hole, okay? And we had no idea how many of them there were, what their density was, what their energy levels were, knew nothing about them, okay? But we were getting ready to go spend lots of time up there, and we didn't know if we needed to armor plate this stuff or not. Sounds like you would need to. Like, armor well, we didn't everything. know. We didn't know. Because we didn't want to armor plate any more than we had to because it took 10 pounds of booster to get one pound in orbit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, they designed a satellite. It was called Pegasus. You can look them up if you want to, but it, it was a satellite and it had two huge wings on it. That's how it got its name. Pegasus. However, these wings were hyper fragile. They were so fragile that if the satellite tumbled at a rate faster than one revolution every two minutes, the wings would break apart. You couldn't handle the centrifugal force. And the covering on it was such that whenever a micrometeorite would hit it, we were able to measure its size and its energy level. And from those two inputs, okay, we could calculate what its speed was, what its mass was, which is the kind of stuff we wanted to know. Okay. So, but we had to get that sucker into orbit. Well, there was a few problems because of that tumble rate. Uh, in order to disconnect anything, we used what was called the explosive bolts. And they did what their name implies. They exploded. Okay. Bolt literally just blew. Okay. Well, when the explosive bolts exploded, that imparted an impulse to everything. Impulse is a form of force acting over time or distance, and that would result in a tumble rate greater than one half of an RPM. Therefore, we could not tolerate separating the last stage from the satellite. Okay. Well, that changed the center of gravity, which also changed the, or the rotational characteristics of the beast. Actually, it made matters worse because we were going to have to be attached. Then one guy had the bright revelation oh my God, if we still have any fuel on board, that's a cryogenic gas. It's going to be venting. That venting is going to result in thrust, which is a force. And oh my God, that's also going to set up. A tumble rate that we can't tolerate. So, have to leave that attached. It's going to screw up our center of gravity. And we got to run out of gas at the same instant that we achieve orbit. Well, we don't know our liftoff weight, plus or minus 5%. And we don't know our thrust plus or minus 5% until we're actually flying. 
and we can get the data from our accelerometers and kind of figure all of that out. Not only that, the engines don't always perform at a constant rate. They do weird things too. So how are we going to get this sucker off the ground, into orbit, and run out of gas at the same instant we achieve orbit? We didn't have a guidance system that was that smart. Not even close, especially in a four kilohertz processor. Okay. So, a guy in my group, his name was uh, Olus Buckaloo. He had been a high school math teacher before he joined NASA. And he was in the same, there was a group of 13 of us in the guidance and control. And I, I was a second semester freshman when NASA hired me. Okay, and to this day, I have no idea why they did. Because <laughs> believe me, I knew absolutely nothing about absolutely everything. And anything I did believe that I knew turned out to be wrong. And, very confident about that, so they believed you. <laughs> hey, I knew I was ignorant, so you want to show me how to do that? Okay. And about three months, yeah, about that, uh, after I started work there, my boss was a textbook southern lady, about five foot nothing. She came walking up to my desk one day and had five of those huge three reminders. I'm not talking about three inch, I'm talking about five inch. <laughs> three reminders. Five of them. Okay. They, they covered her up when she was here. <laughs> Came to my desk, put them on the corner of it, said, we just got some of them newfangled things called a computer. You've been elected. Turn around and walk off. Now, why were there five books? Because there were five computers and no two of them were alike. <laughs> no two of them. They were all unique. And the first assignment I got was to write a program that would calculate the flight of Saturn V Apollo. <laughs> now, not only did I not know anything about programming or computers, I didn't know anything about it physics or math either. <laughs> so what did I do? I dove into the books. Oh, okay. I have no idea what I'm looking at. <laughs> oh, wow. Fortunately, the computers were close and I had unlimited access. So I learned to, I learned computer science in 1961 by trial and error. Yeah, no internet for you to get on and figure out how to do this. No clipping. No, there was those five books. That was it, folks. So, and let me explain to you what trial and error means. Trial and error means it's very trying and filled with errors. Okay? I learned by failure. I crashed more computer programs than I can even count. <laughs> In fact, I even got a reputation at one time. If you want to find out if your software will work, get Goodman to test it. If anybody can screw it up, he can. <laughs> and later, I was put on a particular team because of that talent. Anyway, so I told you that story to get back to the other. By the time we were doing Pegasus, I had written that program. And this is like maybe a year's difference. Okay. And I was using that program all over the place. I mean, we were doing simulations at nausea, trying to figure stuff out. And I had written it so that the guidance was one subroutine of the rest of the program. So I had figured out, duh, I don't want to have to rewrite the whole blooming program just because I'm changing guidance. So, Subroutines. I figured out subroutines before they had the name. Okay? Because I was basically lazy. What did you call them? 
I called it the guidance piece. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're coming up with this. Bolus came up with an idea. And well, gotta give you a little bit more. When it comes to guidance, you pull back up geometry. The geometry of a, of a rocket is that you have the engine providing a thrust vector that is in some way measurable relative to the center axis of the missile. Okay? And there's two places on the missile you care about, the center of gravity and the center of pressure. Center of pressure is where the thrust vectors of the, of the engines cross. Center of gravity is where center of gravity is, okay? You have, the greater the distance between center of pressure and center of gravity, the more stable you are. Assuming center of pressure is in front of center of gravity. If the center of pressure falls behind the center of gravity, you become unstable, which is not good. Okay? So, and that angle is you want to control where that center of pressure is. For example, if you want to steer the missile to the right, you move the center of pressure. Okay? And then, after it's moved, you have to counteract it to stop it from moving. And then you have to center it. So th there's three maneuvers anytime you're doing that. Well, how do we do that? We gimbal the engines. Well, that angle that we gimbal is called chi. C-H-I. I will never forget it. Okay? Each, each engine has to be given a chi command what angle to gimbal at, okay? And it only gets three of those commands per second in those days. So this is not something that you can lollygag about, okay? So on the Saturday we were using, we were using second and third stage, so we had eight engines on the stage that was taking us off the pad, because Saturday five had five engines on the first stage, and each one of those engines had the same thrust as the entire second stage with eight smaller engines. But on the set on the Saturn one, which had eight engines, that meant we had to compute eight chi's. Okay, three two. And uh, and so Bolus was trying to figure out, okay, what can we use as a guidance? Okay. He had the brilliant idea. Well, if I set up a polynomial where the terms of the polynomial are the primary parameters that we use to determine what our guidance ought to be, and then I use some coefficients to give those the correct weight, and we might be able to come, and it turned out to be a Lagrangian polynomial. Okay. Now, did we figure that out by doing the math? Uh-uh. We did iterative engineering, where we would figure out, okay, is it linear, squared, cubed, direct, inverse, for each of those terms, and then what is the coefficient that's got to go along with each one of them? How many terms of them? Uh, we had nine terms, is what we wound up with. We had nine terms, therefore we had nine coefficients. So if I'm doing scientific method, how many combinations of perturbations are there? <laughs> now we got a, we got a coefficient and a term, and there's nine of them. And you're talking about nine, nine factor models. I got nine in pairs. No, they can be the same. So not even. It so, would be nine times nine times nine. Well, it, are there any two-digit coefficients? Hmm? Any two-digit coefficients? Or are you talking about zero to nine coefficients? The coefficients were real numbers. Okay. 
So it could be any real number. Yeah. Well, right. then it's infinite possibilities. There's no. Yes. There's no bigger so, than that. We took my program, and I would deal with his Lagrangian polynomial, and we would run computer simulation. I must have run ten thousand of those, and then we took what our trajectory was and did an RMS of the trajectory against what it should be, the actual trajectory. And we use that to iteratively engineer our polynomial. Okay? Then, we had to get into flight readiness. Because we ever, before every flight, uh, we used the mainframes with another program uh, to do uh, the analysis and simulation for the whole mission, okay? And there, we had about 120 parameters that we had to do simulations through three sigma probability of the range of those parameters occurring, okay? And we had to verify that our mission was going to be successful within three sigma probability of all combinations and permutations of those parameters. That was tens of thousands of computer rooms. Yeah, you didn't even have time. And we would get a stack of paper about that thick from each one. We'd label it. Okay, what it was. Then a couple of guys would go through it. They'd go to the wall and pull a piece of graph paper off the wall before that, and they would plot that data point on there. And then they'd take that, put it back, take that, put that distance. We would wind up with listings all the way around the room that was about twice the size of this room. And the listings would be 3D, floor to ceiling. So you like went to work, did math, went home? No, that was around the clock. Yeah. Oh, when so we did that. didn't go home at all. Right. Didn't matter. Right. And then we took those graphs, and that was the meeting we took to Don Bon and his staff to prove to him that the thing wasn't going to blow up. <laughs> well, it's important. Good. So I told you all of that so that you would have a little bit of appreciation for what happened on the missions, on the Pegasus mission. Remember, we got some tight constraints, okay? So, uh, I didn't go to the cave for that. We observed most launches from Huntsville, because that's where we were, Marshall Specialized Center. And we were observing it there, and the uh, thing lit off, cleared the tower, okay, good. Uh, and telemetry reported, engine two shutdown. I thought, okay, we simulated that, no sweat, okay? Before I finished thinking that, telemetry said, engine four shut down. I thought, oh my God, we didn't simulate that. I have no idea what's gonna happen. And this is right after it cleared the tower. Okay, we hadn't even got to the cloud yet. <laughs> And long story short, we made it. It made it north. Guidance adjusted and adapted. Okay. That little Lagrangian polynomial did its thing. Okay. And it compensated. We made it into orbit. We did it twice. We had two Pegasus up there. They both worked. When we did the post flight evaluation on the first one, we discovered that the whole thing was caused by two symmetric wiring errors. It means that wires had been crossed between those two engines. Engine two and engine four were opposite each other on the outer ring. Okay. So they never failed. No, no, no. Engine two had failed. Okay, it was underperforming. Now, we had two computers. We got guidance and we got control. Two different computers. And they're talking to each other also. Okay. Guidance sends its commands to control. Then control does its stuff. Okay. So, engine two was underperforming. 
control decided to shut it down. So it sent a message to shut down engine two, and it sent that message to guidance. So the guidance could adapt. Okay. First wiring error. That wire didn't go to engine two, it went to engine four. So it didn't shut down engine two, it shut down engine four. Okay. And so we go along and guidance decides, I don't like asymmetric thrust, and I got enough thrust, I can get this thing in orbit anyway, so I'm going to shut down engine four. So it sends that command to control. Control says, okay, I'll shut down engine four, that shut down engine two. <laughs> <laughs> you know how they fixed it so it never happened again? They cut the wires so that they would only reach one engine. Don't <laughs> <laughs> that. Yeah. So, Lagrange and polynomial. Simple, but it took us months to make it work. How long it took? How long did it took since the start beginning till the completion of the whole process? Uh, just under a year. Around the clock. Yeah. Well, when we got into a pre loan certification, that was 24 7 for about four days. And it was a marathon the way we did it. I had written another program that would, now this is punch card days. Okay? Punch cards. I had written another program for an IBM 1620, which was a computer about the size of that desk, but full. Okay. How tall? Stood about that tall. And all, like this whole thing? Yeah. That was the computer. Uh, input was punch cards or typewriter. Output was punch cards or typewriter. Okay. I see somebody play uh, asteroids on that one. No, 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 they grab a couple. No, like the, the, the ones that came out like 10 years later, same thing, punch cards, and then um, typewriter spits it out. You play asteroids on it, so it's like you turn, and it prints it out, and you turn. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I had written a program that would uh, create the data sets in an orderly fashion. Okay, because I wasn't going to sit there and keep my these things. Because we're talking during during an analytical run. Oh God, I mean, we would we would do well. The cart that we used held a hundred boxes of cards, and each box had two thousand cards in it. And we would do a cart run. About one card an hour for 48 hours, 72 hours sometimes. Okay. And that 1620 was what was creating all those cards. Okay. It was punching like crazy. Okay. We were throwing out chips, bringing in, and we had to take those over to the mainframe, which was in a different building that was running the simulation program. And they would take those and they'd put it on the big high speed card reader they had. Okay, take all those in. Cards would go out, we're done with cards. They toss them, okay. And the courier would deliver the cards and then pick up the printouts. Bring the printouts back to us and that's when the people would get on the tables and do the graphing. All that kind of good stuff. Meanwhile, I'm going nuts with the computers, getting cards and printouts, all that kind of stuff. So the 1620 is running for like two days solid, nonstop punching cards. Okay, and that was pretty long. Then we had to analyze all that stuff. Okay, graph paper, and we use French curves to draw the graphs with. So after we got all the data points on there, then we had to go back to every sheet of graph paper and with French curves, draw the graphs. They call them French curves. Uh, I have no idea. 
Are they from France? I have no idea. Oh. We, we, had, we had probably 30 sets of French curves there that we could use to curve fit and draw the curves approximation. They were plastic templates. Yeah. 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 So, and I was 19 and 20 years old when I was doing that. Had no idea what I was doing. None. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So that's good. In that case, what, what made you uh, jump on board on such a big task? Of, uh, being I didn't board? know any better. <laughs> 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 that's good. <laughs> I, I had no sense of what I was involved in. None. Uh, I began to get a sense of it about halfway through because about the time that I graduated from school, uh, we, we were pretty much done with what we needed to do on guidance. By the way, one of the things that came out of the Pegasus stuff is we said, you know, we really need to figure out a way to have an adaptive guidance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we like don't have to go through this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And we, we wound up, we did develop an adaptive guidance. And that adaptive guidance we developed then turned out to form the foundation of every kind of missile guidance that exists. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Are these French curves? Yep. So did you have to find the right one? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that's where you, that, using those, you, you develop a skill that's called a calibrated eyeball. Okay. <laughs> okay. But, uh, anyway, later on, uh, after we had done the adaptive guidance and got that pretty well working, which, by the way, we wound up using that later on toward the end of Apollo, we wound up using that guidance on the winter lander. Uh, but we went, that wasn't for 11, that was for the later ones. Uh, we got it in there. Because we didn't have the computer power to do it. So they had the landing on 11. A landing that was pilot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did it. <laughs> yeah. uh, by the way, Buzz Aldrin is over in Melbourne, Florida these days. He's a uh, professor at MIT. Okay. Yeah. He's a professor. And then my take Florida Institute of Retired? No. You know, he's on, I see him like on Silicon so He just like shows up. He's same, he's same, same, he is the same age as my brother. Wow. Wow. But uh, he's a professor in astrophysics and planetary science. He's teaching over there. Yeah. So in that case, you were working on this part time, full time, and full -time. also full time, and also going. I was working full time. I had a family, and I was going to school full time. My goodness, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. No, it's tired. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point in time, I literally collapsed at work, just fell out for no apparent reason. I was walking down the hall and just like a tree. <laughs> okay. Out. Next thing I remember, I'm um, waking up in a hospital room surrounded by white. What? Going on? <laughs> and it uh, turned out they had me in isolation because they didn't know what was going on. <laughs> and the final diagnosis was I was suffering from exhaustion and malnutrition. Because <sighs> I had one meal a day that was en route from work to school. And it was a Big Mac. Oh, that's <laughs> 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 so, uh, wow. Anyway, later on when I finally graduated, uh, we were pretty much done with the Apollo stuff. And somehow, I, by the way, my whole career, there was nothing premeditated about anything I've ever done. It was all totally accidental. Yes. So I wound up 
being volunteered for a project at West Sands Missile Range in West Texas. I've never left Huntsville. Okay. So here I'm going to the desert. Not really thrilled about that. <clears throat> so uh, I went out there and I, I was doing classified work. I wound up working associated with the Safeguard Anti-Ballistic Missile System, which I found out after the fact my brother was also heavily involved in because at that time he was the chief procurement officer for the Army Missile Command. So <laughs> we were so classified. Yes, I was yeah, we were so classified we didn't know the other one was working in. <clears throat> so I did I did some work out there for guidance. Uh, although it was that was involved primarily in uh, and what today would be called hacking, <clears throat> because my job was to see if I could uh, seize control of a ballistic missile while in flight and redirect it, retarget it. And I did. And because of that, that ended ground guided, ground guided missiles right then and there. Okay. No more ground guided missiles. They're going to be inertial. Thank you. <laughs> Fire and forget. Okay. So, and uh, it's no longer classified, but uh, that that was that was a real interesting experience because I got to use a lot of my physics in that because I had to figure out how I was going to intercept, uh, and I used man in the middle, but how I was going to get in that and do it in such a fashion that they wouldn't know it. <laughs> so that was that, and then uh, once I, that was a fairly short term thing. And then I got a call, and I had been volunteered <laughs> again for a project that was in Whippany, New Jersey. <laughs> And it was uh, on a system that was called SOSUS, S-O-S-U-S. And that was an anti-submarine warfare system. Okay. And there's where I got involved in acoustics. And uh, do any of you know what a Fourier transform is? Fourier transform? Fourier transform, yeah. Very good. Ah, fun. <laughs> that's, that's another man. <laughs> that is when you translate the reference for a, uh, a wave instead of, I always have to stop and think about this, instead of intensity versus time, you get frequency versus time. And the Fourier transform is the mathematics that you use to do the translation. And it is a matrix operation. Okay? And it's a series of multiplies and adds. Okay? Matrix style. Really big matrix. Like 10,000 by 10,000. Okay? And the Fourier transform is so, oh my God, awful. <laughs> that somebody came up with a an approximation of it using a series of approximations. And that's called the fast Fourier transform. <laughs> FFT. Okay. And that is still used today. Uh, your telephone. It's a digital phone. Uh, to convert the signal that comes in digitally into one that you can hear, you have to do an FFT on it. Oh. In real time. And to convert your voice, the signal of your voice, into a digital signal that can go out, let's do an FFT on that. So there is a special processor in your phone that does nothing but FFTs. You probably don't see it. Well, any submarine based on sound. Okay. Uh, we had hydrophones all over the floor of the ocean, and we were listening for Russian subs. And our, our, what we had been told to do was to develop a system such that 
we could detect a Russian sub entering into missile launch sequence with enough lead time so that we could get a weapon on it before it could launch. That was 15 minutes. Okay. Which meant we had to know where it was. And we used acoustics and sound and triangulation. Okay. That we had one entire box that was an FFT box. That's all it did. Okay. Hooked to two mainframes to do all this stuff. Okay. That turned out to be helpful later on when I got involved with the oil companies because I got involved with geophysics, geology, and seismic exploration. What do you use for seismic exploration? Sound waves. But they were changing the math. They were using for that. The math and the physics. Earlier, they had used what was called ray tracing, which is treating the energy like it's a straight line ray. And reflecting and that kind of stuff, that kind of geometry. They did that because it was simpler, the math was simpler, the math was easier. But the computers advanced so that we could do the correct version, which is a wave front. And the wave front interacting. So that completely changes your geometry, completely changes your math. You got to do a whole lot more calculating now. Turns into, again, another matrix problem. And what you've got is a 100,000 by 100,000 simultaneous equation matrix to solve. I, I use R for those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a matrix solution for simultaneous equations. That's what you have to do there. Okay. Similar kind of thing with uh, reservoir simulation. When the old companies get, uh, they have an oil pipe. They figure out how much oil is there, where it is, all that kind of good stuff. And they use a reservoir simulation on the computer to figure out how to get that oil out of the ground and into the pipe. So, and all of that was before 1970. So, since then, involved in a lot of things. The last thing I worked on was the artificial intelligence on board the next generation of unmanned combat aircraft. Oh, X-45 and the X-47, if you want to look them up. They are fully autonomous. Underline the word, fully. That's you scary. give them their mission. That is scary. <laughs> you give them their mission, press the go button. Okay. They are also fully collaborative. Hmm? You can with each other? Absolutely. They are fully collaborative. Who is acquainted with the Borg? They are the Borg. What's the Borg? Can they relate? Uh, it's from Star Trek. It's like a high version. Oh, okay. Like a mechanical high mind. Like, yeah. Okay. Like they all. Talk like, to each like other and move the same conscious. Fully, full collaboration means. Full collaboration. Full collaboration means each individual has full knowledge of the collective, and the collective has full knowledge of the individual. And these are combat aircraft. I'm really scared now. Okay. <laughs> and they replan. They totally replan every 300 milliseconds. And they decide, you give them their mission. So you tell them what to do. They no, 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 you give them their mission. What is to be accomplished? Right, right, right. right. Not, they right. figure out everything is, else. Yeah, because that way <laughs> they just is. go, and if, a, if one fails, they re collaborate their, their job. So that they can accomplish what you told them to do, but not, not you're not telling them every step of the way what to do. Right. How do they do against like man, you know, like man aircraft? Uh, it turns out we've got the technology so that man aircraft also collaborate. <laughs> 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 Until they win, but who wins? Uh, 
not even close. These aircraft can do maneuvers that no human can survive. Uh, yeah, they can. Oh, boy. They can do 60 G maneuvers. Wow. Airplane? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's what he can Yeah. Well, it's like the computer can handle it. Can the airplane handle it? I see what you're saying. And uh, with our current weapon suite that we have, uh, we have what's called all aspect weapons. All aspect weapons. What does that mean? It means you don't have to be pointed at what you're trying to shoot. So if you're trying to use a rocket to take out somebody that's behind you, tell the missile, I want him gone. Fire. Rocket comes out, turns around, goes back. Is that your uh, original guidance system? <laughs> <laughs> Adaptive guidance. <laughs> still works. <laughs> yeah, still how, works. How do uh, pilots feel about this? They love it. They love it. They, they don't have to it. be up there anymore. Because they know they've already run. They, they have already won before they even fire their first round. Uh, in the most recent, just with the Raptor, for example, the F-22 Raptor against the F-15 Eagle. And the F-15, we've never lost an F-15 in combat. Never. Ever. Okay? And in, and in combat with, it, with the F-22 versus the F-15, the F-15 has been shot down before the pilot even knew the F-22 was there. And these UCAVs are orders of magnitude more lethal than they use than uh, like an actual lineup. Not yet. They're order less than a year away from deployment. We've already demonstrated carrier operations. With, uh, so, so what's the point at this point? We, we got computers fighting each other. So well, they, have war. Well, by the way, they've coined some new words yeah. to describe it. You've heard of flights and wings and all the different. They've corned, they've corned a new word for the UCAS. It's called a swarm. Because that best describes what it appears like. Yeah. It appears like a swarm. You have no idea what they're trying to do. Because to you as an observer, it appears completely incoherent. But to them, they know exactly what they're doing. And they can practice deception. Wow. All that horrifying topic. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this you wanted to know about math. That's it. That's <laughs> pretty excellent. And one of the demonstrations we did, this was over 10 years ago. Uh, one of the demonstrations we had, <laughs> we had two of ours, and of course they're stealthy. We had two of ours and six enemy aircraft. Okay. And, uh, our two detected the other six where they were, and they decided what they were going to do. And they came up with, and actually, a textbook maneuver. It's called the clay pigeon maneuver. Okay. What they decided is that one of them was going to uncloak, in other words, become unstealthy, mm -hmm. just long enough for the enemy to detect them. But only the one. Right. Only the, only the one. one. Okay. And once they had confirmed that it had been detected, then it would cloak again <clears throat> and then maneuver. Okay. Then they would both watch how uh, the enemy maneuvered and they waited. And while the enemy was maneuvering to attack the one that had uncloaked and not cloaked and was no longer worried. Anyway, <laughs> they were both positioning to take out the six, air, the six enemy. And it's called the clay pigeon. You set up a target and it disappears, and the others go to get it, and you nail them. Are those, um, they have any kind of uh, like control system on board? No. So they, like once they, they are once fully they fly, autonomous. But they don't even, there's not even someone operating them back at the no, I'm just asking, stages. like, if there's, so there's no way to like cancel an order off. Uh -uh. Like once they go, they just go. They they will accomplish their mission. <laughs> There's a way they probably yeah. uh -huh. like, a big Doctor Strange yeah. like this. Why, I'm, I'm wondering why they wouldn't have a way to cancel. Like if you wanted to cancel, why you couldn't? Don't cancel. want to do that. Security. 
Because yeah. she didn't want to get in behind us. Yeah, you're right. If you didn't, yeah, yeah, so could be out of here. Yeah. So you gotta like, let them just let out, like, you don't put like nuclear bombs on them. Good. Yeah, they do. Yeah, you don't really need nuclear much it's anymore. Not. Regular bombs. Yeah. And now, what kind of fuel do these uh, weapons essentially use for the most part? I'm sorry? What kind of fuel do they, they run? Just electricity in that case? Well, the planes use the same fuel as all of JP4. Yeah, sure. Basically, kerosene. Well, so if there's fully, if they're fully automated planes run on their own, do we have ground, uh, like, tanks or anything that run the same way? We're or boats? There. We're working on it? It's a harder problem. To solve. That's weird. Really? You would think the air would be harder. Now, it turns out the air is a lot easier than the ground. That's why, for example, we're hearing about driverless cars. Yeah, I was about to ask why. No, thank you. Me. I want to be behind whatever is one of those. I, yeah. mm -hmm. Ground is much tougher than air. That's why we don't have There's it. obstacles and stuff in the air. Yeah. There's nothing. Except for crashing. There's just the earth. There's, right. You know where that is all the time. Right. It's not going anywhere. But uh, the ground part, much tougher. Yeah. But... We've still got some interesting stuff going on there. What about boats? Have they made oh, yeah. automated boats? Oh, right. yeah. Uh, submarines? Mm -hmm. Fully autonomous? Yeah, because there's obstacles there. Like farm like combines that just run themselves? Sorry? Yeah, like farm combines that just run themselves, too. Yeah, you could do that. That'd be fairly simple, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or like a plane that sprays for pests by itself because so, it's going. Before I use up all of your time, I told you I wanted to propose something for you guys to think about because you are going to get to deal with it. I might. It, it might happen during my lifetime, but it's definitely going to happen within your lifetime. Okay? And it has to do with the confluence of things that are going on in both physics and computer science now. We are getting to the point where electromagnetic based computing will become antique. And we're going to have light based computing. Mm -hmm. Also, we are going to go away from binary and numerical computing to quantum and symbolic computing. Put that in your math pipe and light it up. Not numerical. It's going to be symbolic. And your solutions won't be yes or no. You will have a very large number of discrete solutions. To put it another way, you'll have a yes and a no and a whole bunch of maybes. <laughs> so, so what what is your math going to look like? More like a language than it already does. That's why I brought up the original point that mathematics is in fact a language. Treat it that way. That is its fundamental nature. It is a language. Absolutely. 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 Mad math is a complete language. Yeah. So it's kind of almost going to be changing from. I'm sorry? So it'll almost be changing from asking yes or no questions to asking for descriptions and explanations. Yeah. Actually, you will start calculating concepts. That will be so your is like thinking computers, though. I'm sorry? I mean, I'm just like, I guess I'm looking at this more on a philosophical level. It's like, where does the, ma where does like the actual artificial intelligence, or in the, in the quantum computing, I mean, where is the distinction between the calculator and something that can like formulate ideas? Okay, where is the intelligence in a computer program? Where does that, where does that derive from? Where does it reside? The, the well, every computer today, you have the programs and you have the data. Okay. Knowledge can reside in either or both. 
Information can reside in either or both. Can understanding reside in either or both? I've spent some time in artificial intelligence. That's why I know. It's fantastic. Okay. That can only reside in the software. It cannot reside in the information. Okay. So, if you're doing symbolic computing, then it is your reasoning, your language, your communication is going to convert that knowledge, I'm sorry, that information into knowledge. However, it doesn't end there. Now, I know current educational paradigms end the learning process that understanding. Sorry, there's two more levels. Artificial intelligence will bring you there. The next level is called discernment. And that is, how do you discern between truth and error? We don't know the answer to that yet. That's why learning has never been turned on in artificial intelligence. It's about to. Okay. Then there's a little beyond that. And that's how do you use that truth? How do you use that error to accomplish something? How do you apply it? And we don't have those answers yet. And they are most likely going to be, the, those answers are most likely going to be mathematical in nature. So, have fun. All right. <laughs> Communicate ideas. I actually I was about to bring that up. Have you had much experience with this? Uh, I'm sorry. Have you had much experience with uh, virtual reality in your? Uh, There's a shark swimming in the water. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, the first time I involved, was involved in virtual reality was after the any submarine warfare thing. I wound up back. I wound up back in the space business, but this time I was in Houston in mission operations, and I was about this deep in uh, what they were doing. In fact, I arrived just a few weeks before Apollo Eleven launched. But. Uh, the first VR I saw was associated with the Apollo flight simulator. Wow. Wow. In 1971. Yeah. Well, they had first reality they, uh, they wouldn't call that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a very pr primitive version. Today we call it a flight simulator. And when you go by the shuttle right. on the simulator, which I've crashed the show several times. <laughs> yeah. yeah, virtual reality. Yeah. What's interesting about that is I'm waiting for somebody to apply quantum physics to the current virtual reality and uh, see what they would come up with parallel universes. Well, how could you know? Think about it. <laughs> Pretty interesting. It's really, really interesting. You know, a professor uh, here at USF lent me this for the past week, and I've been essentially just doing some market research with uh, oh, everybody. Just uh, random students are able to um, just essentially use it for 24 hours and uh, yeah. what their experience is like. Yeah. And uh, it's been so fascinating because initially the, the student that brought these to the classroom yeah. had such a negative view towards uh, virtual reality. It's, oh, it's just another gimmick. It's not going to catch yeah. on. And as soon as the professor offered it to the classroom, I was like, yeah, yeah, please, let me just play with it for a week. Like, this is coming. This is, so it's like as soon as, as AI is infused with this, like a, just the concept of a person's attention just gets completely focused on like whatever is in front of their eyes mm -hmm. immediately. This takes away the yep. whole like idea of like attention deficits and like what ends up happening just in like day to day of real uh, And then you take that and you apply some physics to it. This says everything that you observe is in fact an illusion. Yes. Then uh, how do you reconcile what you're observing with what's actually what actually is? You know, purple cloud, <laughs> mind blown. 
<laughs> it is. It's like looking at me. <laughs> it's wild. By the way, you now have a glimpse in what's going on inside my head. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think about that kind of stuff. <laughs> That's great, Professor. Thank you so much for coming. Well, you're welcome. If I can help, I'm ready, willing, and able. <laughs> Again, so. Come down next year. Yeah, but also, so, who, so essentially, NASA knocked on your door when you were in your second semester. How did that come about? Uh, I'm sorry that I missed possibly that. I, w I was a second semester freshman at the University of Alabama. Totally confused, totally lost, and had no idea what I was doing or why I was there or anything else. Uh, me and my courses did not peacefully coexist, uh, any of them. And uh, about the only thing I was really interested in was bowling, and I got pretty good at it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one day I got a message from guidance. At least that's what you call them today. Uh, and uh, they said they wanted to see me. I said, mm, okay, probably what they want to see me for is to tell me they don't want me back. Oh, no. <laughs> well, hey, I was completely unremarkable. Okay? <laughs> completely. And so I finally worked up the courage to go by. And when I walked in, they said, oh, yeah, we have this thing. Um, uh, it, it's it's like a work study. It'll be a full time job with benefits, and they'll reimburse you your college expenses. And I said, sold. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. That's that, was, that was literally everything I knew about it. I didn't know where it was. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know anything. I didn't even know when it started. I didn't care. <laughs> and it turned out to be in Huntsville. I found out that it was with NASA, even though I didn't know what NASA was. Okay, I found out it was NASA when I was in the uh, HR thing, filling out the paper, and I saw NASA on the paper. I said, "Okay, what's NASA?" Okay. <laughs> Ooh, <so> funny. <laughs> and that's how I got in. Totally by accident. I still have no idea. Don't, mm -hmm. don't have a clue. So who's the best bowler? That's the guy we need to go with Scott. You have no idea why they put me in guidance? I did it. No idea at all. Oh, yeah. How long was it after you had started before they assigned you to the computers? About three months. Wow. It was about three months when she came walking up to my desk with those manuals. That's probably a job she didn't want to do. <laughs> got these new angle things called a computer. Yeah. You've been elected. Yep, I'm not doing it. You're doing it. Wow. Mm -hmm. There was something that prompted them to think that you were good at picking up lots of new tasks on the way, but like they knew in advance that like, they were going to assign you to this computer. I have, I have no idea. You're just the guy. <clears throat> I have no idea. I so just showed up and did whatever they told me. And I did that for years. My whole career has been that way. And, and except for now that I'm teaching at the high school, teaching at the high school level was the first thing I've done that was premeditated. <laughs> okay. Everything else, just like I said, they decided to send me to El Paso. Then they decided to send me to New Jersey. Then they decided to send me back to Houston. And when I left the space program, I was in Houston. And I got to think, well, what am I going to do? Houston. Oil. Duh. Okay. <laughs> so I wound up involved in the oil business. And where did they put me? In geophysics. In geology. In seismic. What do I know about this? <laughs> and I wound up working with a guy for about 10 years after that. He and I wound up carpooling together. He was a graduate from Colorado School of Mines. And he and I had gotten to know each other at NASA. And he left NASA the same time I did. And he had what was called a gold certificate from Colorado School of Mines. That's beyond a PhD. Okay? He had taken every 
physics and math course that school offered. What did you say? It was called gold. It was called a gold certificate. Gold That's certificate. beyond a PhD. Beyond. Okay. And I had met him when I was with NASA in Houston. And I wound up going to work for the same outfit. And so we carpooled back and forth. So for 10 years, I got two one and a half hour discussions on geophysics and geology. <laughs> Talk about an education. <laughs> I learned far more after I got out of school than I ever learned in school. And up until now, teaching, everything I've been involved in has been something that had, number one, never been done before, and number two, nobody knew how to do it. Hmm. We were having to figure out, for the first time, how to do this. In fact, the actual motto during the Apollo program, from that, the actual motto was, Everybody knows that nobody knows how to do this. It's never been done before. Wow. This is a time to be around, you know? Wild and crazy. And we had security issues, too. We knew we had Russian spies yeah. around. So now. And we would give them misinformation just to mess with them. <laughs> did you, did they, how did you know who they were? How did you know who they were? The security issues told us. Oh, they just told you this is the Russian spy, by the way, giving some fake Yeah, there, for example, there was a radio station on the laptop not far from this one, Arsenal. FM radio station. And security told us that was a Russian listening post. Huh. So, I was listening to it. Yeah, so we would mess with them, give them misinformation. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> <love> that. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming, Mr. Gilman. Sure, anytime. And, uh, that's uh, all right. And if you happen to see somebody or know somebody who's at SMA as a student, you might try to persuade them to get into one of my classes. I've, I've got two employees that are at SMA. <clears throat>